Again, this is a pretty substantial portion, but um, I believe it's absolutely beneficial that we read the entire text. Um, this is the Word of God, Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 20, the entire chapter. Again, the context is um, Moses uh, preaching his three sermons before the people of Israel finally makes the entrance into the land of Canaan. Uh, Moses is basically telling them, I cannot go with you, uh, which is a huge challenge for the people, but now God is raising up a different leader, but Moses is the one who led them through the, the wilderness journey for 40 years. And now we're in his second sermon, and this is what we read in chapter 8. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to you, swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not that he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna that you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that, heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of wines, of vines and fig trees and uh, pomegranates, and a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And you shall eat and be full, and you shall uh, bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when you, your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be uh, heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the grace, the, the great and terrifying wilderness, which its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground, where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God, and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. I don't know. Um, maybe I saw too many movies, but when I read that passage, I could hear a voice of a man, <laughs> a man who would look like Moses, how would Moses look? Uh, pretty rugged. Uh, that, that voice, it's, it's a very stirring sermon. It's a sermon of um, a great weight, uh, wise words. Um, it's actually about two places. Uh, one, the place that they have been living. In fact, many of them are born in this place. And that place is the wilderness. 
as it says in verse 2, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. So the first place is wilderness, and the second place that he's going to talk about is the good land. The name for it is Canaan, C-A-N-A-A-N, Canaan. So Canaan is the land that they are destined to go, and that's the land that they're going to conquer, right? That's the, that's the reason why they are all waiting, armed, uh, to make that grand entrance over the River Jordan. But so far, they've been living in the land of wilderness, and the 40-year wilderness had particular characteristics to it. Um, Moses is telling them about the future that when you enter into the land of Canaan, it's going to have a different set of characteristics. But at the end of the day, end of the message, he's essentially going to say, the challenge may be given to you in two different places. Ultimately, the answer is the same. They need to see that, even though their circumstances may be different. What's the wilderness? Well, wilderness, 40-year journey, was like a probation. God's plan for the Israelites was not to keep them in the wilderness, but to through, journey through the wilderness, they will enter into the land of Canaan. That's what God promised them. So if Canaan is sort of a fulfillment, then wilderness is like a probation. And the word we hear here in this text is the word test, T-E-S-T. -E and I think that would be the key word to understand this passage. And I don't think it's um, strange that when Jesus was tested in the wilderness after he fasted for 40 days and nights, when Jesus was tested by the devil, when devil said, turn this stone into bread, Jesus said what? He said, no, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And that word which Jesus spoke is the exact quote out of verse 3, isn't it, of this passage that we read. It's no wonder, because chapter 8 of Deuteronomy is about testing. What did God do? in the wilderness. God tested them. God revealed what was hidden in their hearts. It's not that God didn't know, but this was the way to reveal it publicly, to show in history what these people are. And through the period of testing and through the probation, God stripped off the old generation and God reclothed the people with a new generation. The old self is stripped away and a new self is put on, right? So there is a, a process of sanctification that happens through the wilderness. And we already talked about this. Uh, don't forget that this is about testing. Wilderness was the place where you were tested. Uh, many of you had uh, final exams recently. Uh, the place where I uh, do part-time teaching, uh, the final exams just ended this past week. So there are a few of our people here who are students there, and uh, you didn't look very good last few weeks <laughs> because you were going through the final exams. And I um, test the students in my class. How do I test them? Well, I make them do uh, research. I make them present the end of their research or the product of their research publicly. And uh, even the ones that may not be so happy to do public speaking, they have to do it. It's part of testing. And then they need to answer questions publicly. And at the end of the class or end of the term, they need to turn in a pretty well put together research paper, a final paper that I would grade. Well, I graded a couple of the graduating seniors already uh, this past week because their grades had to be turned in before Monday, coming Monday. Um, and what, what was I doing? I was looking into those papers. I kind of knew what they were like, you know, because in the class, um, you know, there are about 20 students that sat in my class uh, this semester. It was a pretty good size. But when I look at the eyes of the students, when I hear what they're saying, you know, I kind of know what's in them, yet I still test them 
using concrete means. And as they turned in the fruit of their research, I see the flow of their logic. I see signs of weaknesses. I see signs of strengths. And at the end of the day, I have to give them grades. And of course, everybody wants A. There's a rumor that people take my class because they get easy A's. <laughs> but that's not going to be true. Um, a is not easy. B is easy in my class, but A is not easy. I just want you to know. Let people know that, okay? So I went through the process of testing for them, and they were tested through this experience. And that's what wilderness is. It's a tough place to be. But once you enter into Canaan, it's like now the testing is over and something new is upon you. It's, it's the settlement time. Settlement. You, you settle down in the promised land and no longer will there be manna every day, a food that fell from heaven. No longer will they find miraculous water from rocks as you know, a dry place will suddenly have this rock and that rock will split open and the water will gush out and none of that. No longer will there be this kind of daily supernatural provisions by God, like God's hands has always felt that way, but now they are in a new place where, Moses says, it's a good land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. He particularly says it's a land where water naturally flows, and there are springs of water that comes out of the ground. And there you can do agricultural work. You can raise cattle. You could build houses. You could actually have life settled. Okay, so let's put it this way. They were living in the wilderness in a daily demonstration of supernatural grace. But now they're entering into a, a land where now they can rely on God's common grace, a grace that seems evident in nature, right? No longer every day they wake up feeling like, God, drop me bread from heaven. They now have to go and work. Now they have to cultivate. Now they have to water the plants. They have to do all these things. They need to feed the cattle, right? They need to do all these things so that they can have good things from the land. You see what's going on here. So in the testing time, it was testy because there's nothing that they could do with their own hands. It, it was like God was literally carrying them through 40 years. All they had to do is stop complaining and trusting God. Right? But that time is now coming to an end. Now they come into a land where they are adults, in a sense. They are no longer infants. They are no longer kids that parents would have to feed them, bottle feed them every time. Now what God is doing is, hey, look, here's the land. Live it. And now they come into that land, and what do they have to do? They need to do things with their hands. They need to plan. They need to gather. They need to, you know, live it out. Not as kids living day to day, but they need to live it out with bigger vision in life. That's a, that's a challenge. These people never had that. Now they are finally settling in a new land with these possibilities. Okay? Now then, what's wrong with it? It's great. Well, wilderness is great because wilderness is where God takes care of you supernaturally. It's the place where God feeds you every day. He measures the amount that He gives, and He gives them to you. But now Canaan is great because Canaan is like you could do things with your hands. Now, there you could plan. You could make your own decisions. There it seems like now you're grown up. You're treated no longer like kids. Now you're treated like older people. Ability to do things in a more mature way. But further comments that Moses provide, it's not exactly what we expected. You know, you know how it is when you graduate from school. Okay, Amy's going to graduate this, this Thursday. And of course, I would say something like, Amy, um, you studied so hard. She was a hardworking student. Finally, your hard, hard days are over. Now you have easy life coming before you. Finally happy, okay? All right. Um, you were looking for a man of your life. Finally, you found that man. 
And now you're going to get married. And at the wedding, I'm going to say, congratulations. Well, don't look around. Congratulations. You, you've arrived. Finally, you got what you were looking for. Now, happiness is before you. Um, you get the point. Wouldn't it be great if Moses said something like, look, you suffer so much for the 40 years that you were living in the wilderness. All you who knew nothing about the wilderness, those people that were, that were under the age of 40, only thing you knew was this kind of very transient life in probation. Uh, you worked so hard, but now, congratulations. You've arrived. Only thing remaining before you is nothing but happiness. The land is a good land. Go enjoy it because that's what God wants you to do. Instead of saying that, Moses actually says, well, uh, I, I tell you, it's going to be a continuous testing. It's a different place, but essentially the fact that you are being tested is not going to change. It's going to be a different kind of testing. It's a different phase in your life. And ultimately, he's going to say the answer is the same. You didn't go through the wilderness just to graduate it. You didn't simply live it out so that you could just get it over with and then you could start something completely new in a new way. The reason why God placed you in the wilderness is so that you may learn how to humble yourself and trust God, even when you are in Canaan. That's the key. That's what you don't want to miss. Because Canaan throws a whole new temptations. But now the temptations may look different, but the answers to those temptations are or should be the same. You need to trust God. You need to listen to His Word. You need to humble yourself and focus your eyes on one and only provider. That's the key. Well, what happens in the land of Canaan. Uh, Moses warns, warns them, uh, there, there are basically about three specific warnings. Uh, take care statement, take care lest you do this. Um, verse 11 says, first of all, take care lest you forget the Lord your God. When you go to the land of Canaan, be warned that you do not forget the Lord. So the first warning or first kind of temptation that they, may, they will face when they go into a land which then is a good land, a land that they can cultivate, a land where they can work with their own hands and get the products they look forward to. In that land, when you have the success there, right? In that land, be, be aware because there is a whole different kind of testing, and that testing is going to be perhaps even harder, perhaps even more serious, because it's going to boost up your pride. What's happening is they will have the temptation to forget the grace of God, be blinded to all that God has done to them and what God is still doing. They become blinded. They become forgetful of what God has done to them, and they begin to puff up or be raised up in pride. I don't know, brothers and sisters, where you are in the station of your life. I mean, I kind of know where you are as I see it, but you know. You know exactly where you are, at least from your perspective. You know where you've been. Some of you might be saying, well, it's been so hard, and I've worked so hard through my 20s and my 30s, and now I feel like I'm more established, and I don't have to worry so much about the things I used to worry. I don't worry about grocery every week now, or I don't worry about taking you know, exams or, or oral tests or, or, or comprehensive exams, getting through a certain major degree program. I don't have to worry about these things now. I'm here. I'm, I'm more set. There's a lot bigger salary. There's a lot greater respect that people give me. I, I feel like I've arrived somewhere. Well, I don't know. Is that where you are? Or maybe there are some of you that are feeling like you're still in the wilderness. But don't worry. It's okay. We're saying it applies the same. 
But what happens to your heart, unfortunately, is if you are flourishing, if you feel like you are successful, there's that huge temptation of to forget, uh, to forget, forget what God is up to, what God is doing. You become blind to God. Why? Because you get puffed up in pride. You know what a, a pride is? Pride is basically saying, you know, I'm the greatest. And there are a couple of words that describe uh, the state of being prideful. One is being puffed up. I, I think that's, that's a very good biblical description. To be so swollen up, blown up, your ego just expanding. So what happens at the end is that you don't no longer notice anybody around you. All you see is you. It's really tragic when you become so prideful that you don't see others around you. But you know what's more tragic is when you don't see God around you. You no, no longer have perception of God because your heart becomes so numbed by your own pride. Another word would be to be lifted up or to be raised up. You, you are so raised up high in your own eyes. Again, you don't see anybody. I'll tell you what, when you are puffed up, when you are raised up, when your hearts are filled with yourself, you know what you don't do? You don't listen to God. You don't listen to God. The Word of God doesn't get through into your head. You become kind of numb. You, you sort of become that, that block of stone or block of rock where you, anything could come at you, but you feel like, oh, I'm so strong, nothing will penetrate. Moses is warning you, or God is warning us through the Holy Spirit, or Holy Spirit is warning us through Moses, I should say, the words of Moses here, that, that we should be alarmed, we should be cautious if we no longer have a craving for the Word of God, if we feel like we could live a whole week without even referring to God, we, we could live a whole week without going to the Word, if hearing the Word of God is not life to you, that suddenly you longer live, you no longer live with the Word of God as being the bread of life, but now you're living by the things of the world, then what? You're dying. Be aware, lest you forget, because you forget the grace of God, you get puffed up in your own pride. And that means what? You no longer listen to God. You say, I don't need to hear the Word of God. I don't need to read the Scripture. I don't need to go to that. I don't need to look up, you know, what God would desire of my life because I'm fine. I'm okay. I know what I'm doing. In fact, I'm totally, totally sufficient. Second thing that Moses warns is that they would become boastful. But these are all connected, right? Their heart will be lifted up. Verse 17, be aware lest you say in your heart, okay, here it is, be aware again, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. I did it. I did it. It's a reinterpretation of history that's completely erroneous. It's wrong. So these people will begin to say things like, well, 40 years in the wilderness, no longer the story of God's grace and God's careful protection of them through those years of journey. No longer. Suddenly it becomes a story of their own heroism. I did it. When all those people fell, I stood. When they all lost their lives, I survived. And more than that, now they're in Canaan and they're saying, well, I did it. I was able to do this so well through my own wisdom, through my own abilities. I built the house. I cultivated the land. I did all this. I'm the one with great social skill to keep my employees motivated. I'm the one who's smart enough to get the best answer for all the problems of my clients. I did it. It's all about me. And suddenly it becomes very boastful. Boastful. It connects well with pride, of course, but uh, it's, it's a little more technical when you say boastfulness. It's, it's, it's now you're beginning to say, well, 
I did it. Applause me. You should love me because I'm the one who did it all. Accomplishments. Um, brothers and sisters, um, one thing I think the Lord really doesn't like is us boasting. Not boasting of what God has done through his grace. Like what Paul said, I boast of nothing but the gospel of the cross. Not that kind of good boasting. You know, Paul says, if you're going to boast, boast in the Lord. Not that, but when you begin to give all the credits to yourself, Paul says in 1 Corinthians and also chapter 2, that famous passage in the, book, in the letter, to the, letter to Ephesians, where Paul makes it very clear to us that if there is salvation given to us, it is all through grace. It's a gift from God. And he uses the word faith. And then he says, not by works, so that no one may boast. What God doesn't want to hear from you is boasting about your own accomplishments. You didn't do it. God enabled you to do it. You didn't enrich yourself. It says, it is He who gives you power to get wealth. It is God. It is God who works in you. Don't ever come to a conclusion, I earned my own salvation. I worked hard more than others. What is directly antithetical to the word faith is boasting. So please don't misunderstand and say, well, I have a great faith. He or she has great faith. Why? They serve so diligently. They serve so hard. You know what faith is? Faith is not something that you can identify and say great or small in a quantifiable way. Faith is none other than that attitude or that, that state, that state of mind, state of the whole of you, everything about you that is utterly dependent on God. That's what faith is. Faith means that you completely trust God's grace for everything. That's what faith is. So you never say, I have a great faith, so it's something I've done. No, when you have great faith, you know what that means? You are absolutely humble before God, and you are able to say, God, everything is from you. You are the one that I'm completely dependent on. That's what faith means. You can't boast about your faith. I can't boast about my faith. You know, don't, don't encourage one another that way, saying, oh, you're such a man of faith. What the heck is that? How do you know? Once you begin to see certain highlights in their lives that seems to bring credit to themselves, don't you know that that is the greatest crisis of faith? That's the time when you begin to question yourself, am I in faith or am I in boastfulness? What God does not desire is to be boastful. You know, it's, 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 it's hard as we as you grow older in life. We, we are naturally wanting to get more credit for things we've done. We want to make some meaning out of our lives. And even as we talk about grace, grace, we're often craving for credit, credit. We want people to honor me. You know, we're getting into the 20th year of Jubilee, and, and I often hear now, I mean, 20 years seem like a pretty long time. I'm, some people have done ministry 30 years, so I, you know, that's still more. But I thought about it, 20 years, that, that's a long time, isn't it? 20 years, what happened 20 years ago? I was 35. Now I'm 55. There was a man that came to our first service and... Uh, Never left, so he's still with us. There's just one man that came to the first service and, and never left. In fact, there were two men that came, and the other guy kind of left after one year. But, but two men, one man never left. Uh, but then I thought about it. I said, wow, he was 50 when he came. Now he's 70, retiring. That's a, that's a long time. 
We love to give credit to one another. Oh, Elder Lee, you stuck around for 20 years. The church is what it is all because of you. Oh, no, 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 Reverend Park. I hate that word, the reverend. But anyway, you know, when, you, when you honor, oh, the reverend Park, you did it. You were the one who stuck around for 20 years all through the hard time. You did it. We love to do that to one another. Oh, no, you did it. Oh, no, you did it. But you're actually saying, I did it. Right? So we're kind of enjoying that kind of complimentary. It's, it's like give and take, give and take. It's all part of a conspiracy. <laughs> but that's, that's why I began to think in the beginning of this year, whatever I do, uh, whatever happens, let it, let it not be about us. You know, let's not have a huge celebration. Let's not have like, you know, some big hoopla. But what God desires of us is humble reflection of all that He has done for us. Easy to say, but we often fall into boasting. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to look into your hearts right now and see how easy it is because we are fallen people to sin. Do you feel like you've gotten somewhere? Do you feel like you're now accomplished to a degree? And now are you giving yourself a little hello, you've done well kind of congratulatory actions or you know, emotional padding, whatever it is, and now you're beginning to say, now I deserve it. I could get something bigger, something better. I could do this, I could do that now. I deserve it. Well, it's not like God wants us to have nothing. He gives us so much. Isn't that what Moses is saying? You get so much. But don't let that make you feel like I've done it. That's silly. That's not maturity. That's childlikeness. I mean, not in a bad sense. That's being immature. Finally, finally, the last thing that he says in verse 19 is this. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. You know what that says to me? It says, hey, look, guys, you think that being in the wilderness was like a battle time? It's like it's the war time. That's the war zone. Now you're in Canaan. What do you have now? Peace time? No more war? Every, everything's just nice and calm. It's normal? No. Moses is saying, No. Spiritual warfare continues. So when you are in Canaan, and if you forget the fact that you're still in spiritual warfare, and there, if you become complacent, if you become disarmed spiritually, you shall surely perish. You survive the wilderness, but in Canaan, you will perish because you have disarmed yourself. That's a great reminder for us, brothers and sisters, wherever we may be, what state of life we may be, don't ever forget that you're still in spiritual battle. Your stake may have become greater, not less. Your scope of influence is bigger. Your sins, your downfall will affect more people. Perhaps in the wilderness it was all about your problem, but now if you fail spiritually, all those people who have 